So this video is on designing PCBs for debugging and going over your first board spins, things you need to do to help you out with troubleshooting. So first thing about troubleshooting and building out your first PCBs is don't worry about your board size. Uh, your compactness of your board on your first spin is not important unless you're working with RF sensitive components that need to remain generally in the same layout, layout to get the same performance you are expecting. So for the most part, if your board is two, three, four times the size of what your end product will be, that is completely fine. That's gonna make your job a lot easier when you're troubleshooting your board and doing your code. Now this is very important for your first board spins. Have test points everywhere. It's way better to have too many test points than not enough on your first board spins. Um, you do not need any test points, test pins between RF components. Make sure you use test pads instead because those different RF sensitive connections need to remain small so they don't act as an antenna. Um, also you can use zero ohm resistors. We'll go over that in more depth later and double row header pins. They don't necessarily have to be 100 mil, but 100 mil header pins are easy to find and you can use those between all the connections coming off your ICU for example and that'll allow you to be able to test your signal and break connections in seconds. If you need to do pin remapping rather than having to do a complete another board spin or remapping it in the code, you can just jumper one pin to another and remap your pins manually and this will save you a lot of time and then when you come to your final board spin you can map those properly and then you need to design your PCB so that your individual systems can be isolated and you need to do this as much as possible sometimes that's not the case uh, sometimes it's not feasible to isolate each and every individual system but as much as you can, make it where each one has its own power line and goes to the ground plane and the system connections are not um, run all across the board that each component of your subsystems is with that subsystem and not on the other side of the board. So your zero ohm resistors, this is something that um, I found to be extremely useful in some of my last projects. And when you're unsure if a resistor is going to be needed or the exact value of the resistor or if you just want to um, leave it open for breaking connections, um, you can use zero ohm resistors. Rather than cutting connections all over your board, if you just put some zero ohm resistors in, you can pop them off when needed and put them back on. This is a second method to, rather than doing all the jumpers, for some other connections you can just do zero ohm resistors. Um, also having a uh, empty capacitor pads is another thing to think about if you're unsure if you're going to need a capacitor or what value it might be just go ahead and throw the pads in there it's not going to hurt the design and you can um, put a capacitor pad in later if it, if you need one now breadboarding this is not a must-have step but this will save you a lot of time and headache especially starting out as a in PCB hardware design um, what breadboarding proper breadboarding will do it's gonna allow you to break your board up into individual components test them one at a time this saves you from rushing into your PCB design when your teammates want to get jump start on the coding or whatever it is that's normally the case. You want to get your design and start testing it so you can start debugging, which is sometimes the longest process when you're starting out with your PCBs. So breadboards is a great way to do this. You can get uh, the people started on their individual components and they can start coding and working through it and they'll bring design changes to you before you even do your first spin of your board because they already started testing it and realizing that things needed to change. And then you do not need to breadboard RF sensitive circuits. Um, even though you're doing short connections, those lines underneath your circuits are a lot longer than your actual, than your connection. And you're gonna end up with a different product in the end anyways. It's almost a waste of time if you're gonna have anything that's going to depend on your trace sizes and your, um, your magnetic frequencies, interference and things. 
some tips for effective breadboarding is to only breadboard small circuits or systems of the board. Um, go ahead and buy multiple boards. If you have six different components of your board, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to buy six different breadboards. Um, and then go ahead and buy a the spools of the 22 gauge wire. You can find them all over the place on Amazon. They sell them in kits and use those so you can cut them to exact sizes. That helps to clean it up so you don't have boards jumping up all over the place and it gets really confusing. Um, you start and just make your your traces extremely clean, as clean as you can, and color coat things so it makes it easier to track down one system from another and where your power is and where your ground is. Now, when you have the SMD components, your surface mount components, get the through-hole adapters. They aren't that expensive and it makes your life easy. You can immediately start working on mic controllers or whatever it is um, from the surface mount components if you have the adapters to the 100 mil breadboards. And then use them as building blocks like Legos. If you can see here on the breadboard itself, you see little uh, little pins sticking out, little connectors. Every bed breadboard I've ever worked with has these, and that's because they want you to be able to connect multiple breadboards up. So as you build one system, when you're ready to connect it to another, connect it like Legos or building blocks. Now, breadboarding can get really frustrating, but in the end, it can save you a lot of time. If you're taking time to, if you're unsure how to lay out a specific circuit in your PCB, you're going to save a lot more time and money by doing it on a breadboard first to ensure that you know what's going on before you spin your. So after you've done all your due diligence, you've made your circuits on your breadboards and you think you're ready to spin your first board, you need to stop for a second and do a pre-spin checklist. So I'll provide an example of these. Um, coming up and you need to hold a design review so you do your own checklist first and then hold your design review this design review I'm sure everyone has already heard of these if you're already building PCBs but you're gonna make all of your supporting dimensions and materials available all your example circuits all your data sheets all your simulations anything you have and that includes your pre um, your pre-spin checklist that you completed. Make sure that when they ask a question about your design that you don't back it up with something you think or guess. Make sure you back it up with something from a data sheet or from supporting materials so later you're not saying you thought it was one way and when it was in reality some entirely different. And then you can always bribe foods and drink, food and drinks or whatever it is to get people to come to your design reviews and enjoy them. Uh, normally, you don't need to do any bribery because you will be returning the favor very soon to one of your friends who needs a design review from you. So that's what makes it all go around. Now, this is an example pre-spin checklist, and I checked out multiple examples to see how complete this one was. Yours may change according to exactly what board you're doing, and you can add to this list as you see fit. But... Number one, you need to go do your schematic design review, and this is how you can run your um, design reviews as well. You're going to check your net names, your off sheet ports, your power make sure all your power supply pins are connected. Next, you're going to do your schematic DRC, making sure that there's no errors, and then do a footprint scrub. Um, make sure you have complete manufacturer part numbers on your footprints. Your part numbers match the footprints on the PCB and your pinout in the schematic. Your footprint pin number is on the is right side up and correct. I've already done this multiple times on many board spins, and it's something that I double triple check now. Sometimes the software will automatically change how you originally mapped your pins depending on what software you, you've used or you use. And also, you need to make sure your footprint dimensions are correct and double check all of those. It's a very time consuming process, but it's going to save you a lot of headache in the end. Um, make sure your clearances and your keep outs and everything are up to spec. And then mating connections are oriented correctly. So if you have one to one, two to two, etc. Your PCB dimensions and holes need to be double checked and your PCB DRC now for your actual what's going to be printed. And then 
your fab drawing has all layers and the callouts that you need before you send it off to get printed. So you printed your board, it comes back, now what do you do? And for your first board spins, it's not always recommended, but most of the time if you can, solder the components yourself or only have them solder certain components that are going to be very difficult for you to be soldering yourself. Um, you can populate the power supply components to start with. This is something you can't do if you have them populate your board for you and send it to you. You can populate your power supply components first and then test it. Apply power, make sure you limit the current and make sure it's working properly. And then solder on your MCU and run some basic code through it. So you should be able to know that your MCU is going to receive the correct amount of power and then you can test it and make sure that your programming pins are working and that your MCU is not burned out before you get everything soldered on around it. Then you're going to start adding on subsystems one at a time and write your test code for each and every one of them just to make sure something simple, to make sure every single one of them works. This method will work every time for any board complexity and it only takes one major bug to make this process much faster. It seems very tedious, but it can save you days by just taking time to sort by taking one more day to solder on every component individually and test your systems individually. So when you're applying power for the first time, again, start with a low current limit and you have these power supplies that have current limits on them for a reason. Look in your data sheets, do a little research and find out what current limit is going to ensure everything you just soldered on is not going to burn out. And you can catch stuff before you have to replace it. And then power up each and every subsystem and test it independently. So your test code, when you're doing your test code, make sure you keep it modular. Make sure that you can test each and every peripheral device individually and you can remove functionalities from your missing peripherals. Um, you start with a logical code that's independent of any hardware peripherals and then you should add them on one at a time. Now instead of making one big code, of course everyone's heard this over and over, but needs to be said again, do not just make one big code. Set all your peripherals out and use the hashtag define or your hashtag if def. And that will allow you to call in these peripheral devices as one big chunk of code. And when you're commenting them out, you will just have to come out, comment out one or two lines rather than commenting out hundreds or thousands of lines. This makes it significantly easier to add and remove functional blocks of code in an MCU. And that's going to save you a lot of time in tearing your code apart and making it look absolutely awful. Now, this is a very common issue on boards and one that uh, a cool tip that I found that I thought I would share. Now, if your supply rail is stuck to ground anywhere, it's measuring zero ohms with an ohm meter. Instead of just using ohm meter for troubleshooting, go ahead and number one, power up your test bench supply and then set the voltage normally and the current current limit to a few hundred milliamps. You're going to print out a printed circuit board design that you have on paper and make sure you have it right beside you while you're doing this. You're going to find a DMM that measures in microvolts. So you this is going to be a very subtle measurements that you're doing on your board. And you're going to measure your microvolts starting at your supply terminal and you're going to write down that voltage drop on each of the PCB uh, you're going to, on each place in the PCB that you're measuring. Now by looking at each and every voltage drop and the dif different microvolt, the microvolt differences, you'll be able to trace down exactly where the current is going without depopulating or chopping up your PCB. And this will save you a lot of time and money in the end. Better, It's better than using an ohm meter because you can pump a lot more current through it and you're going to be able to see very subtle drops that you're not going to catch with an ohm meter. And a similar technique will also work for finding shorted traces and on otherwise populated boards. Run the board and use a scope to find the digital traces that are in and in between voltage ranges.
As always, thanks for watching, and feel free to place more tips or tricks that you find extremely useful in your troubleshooting or in your printed circuit board design in the comments section.